downloaded the Buckeye Leafcast with your host, Andrew T. Evans, with special guest, Chris Stefani. Well, ladies and gentlemen, guess what? It's about that time. <laughs> it's the Buckeye Leafcast. I'm Andy Evans, and you know who is joining me, the intergalactic Buckeye fan himself, Mr. Chris Stefanik. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Sir? Stefanik, how goes it this evening, sir? Oh my God, just living the dream, my man, living the dream. It, well, I've got an ice cold beverage, and I'm about to talk some Buckeye football with my man, so uh, I can't get much better than this. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. We just just getting ready to talk about a game where we have more yardage, five seventy nine to one hundred and thirty four. I mean. Oh my and this goodness. is versus a Big Ten team. Like Andy. Oh my goodness. Sixty five yards passing and sixty nine yards rushing. We're like remember we were complaining about the defense last week? I I didn't I do not recall ever seeing numbers like that, even against like the little sisters of the poor. I don't remember seeing sixty five passing, sixty nine <laughs> rushing. Wow. The Scarlet and Gray triumphing over the Scarlet Knights in Ohio Stadium on Saturday, fifty two to three. And as you just mentioned, Chris 65 yards passing did Rutgers get, as well as 69 yards rushing, a total of 134 yards. The Buckeyes, however, rolling up 579 total yards, 354 through the air on both the arms Of our boys, Dwayne Haskins and Tate Martell. We'll go into those stats here in just a minute. They also rolled up 225 yards on the ground. Uh, Buckeyes perfect in the red zone, four uh, four for four. Also controlled the football just a little bit longer than the Scarlet Knights. 31 minutes and 37 seconds to their 28-23. Defense, though, Chris, we'll get into the offense here in a minute. Um, But defense was certainly looking worlds better than what we saw against Oregon State. Now, is that because of the opponent, or is that because do you think there were some defensive adjustments going into this one, and the defense was a little more focused and maybe shook some of the cobwebs and yeah, some of the uh, the jitterbugs out of them after Oregon State? I'd say a little column A, a little column B. You know, the, as, as uh, you know, I, I thought Rutgers would be not a challenge for Ohio State, but a stiffer opponent than Oregon State. Uh, Rutgers sure, certainly didn't look like Me they too. were a better team than Oregon State, uh, for what it's worth. But, you know, at, at the same time, after Nick Bosa, you know, the the next most important players on the on the defense, or maybe even more important than Nick Bosa, because if Nick Bosa goes down, there's, you know, they're... Chase Young is also unblockable. I mean, he's not as good as Bosa, but he's still pretty darn good. You know, uh, Draymond, BB, these guys are just, you know, blowing up the opposing offensive lines where, you know, Jordan Fuller, he comes in and all of a sudden the secondary is set right. You know, he's in there making adjustments yep. to what the defense is doing, getting guys lined up right. And, oh, yeah, yep. you know, is a nice, sure tackler that takes good angles and all of that, which... You know, some of those guys that uh, he was taking playing time away from by <laughs> returning to health this week were not so great at. And Tough Borland getting more snaps this week. You know, he, he's been on a snap count. He only got 10 in week one. I don't know how many snaps he got in week two, but it was clearly more than 10. And that helped a lot, too, because the guys backing him up are not so great either. So, so yeah, I mean, I think with, with Tough and Fuller back in there, that helped a whole lot. And then... I think Rutgers, they're you know they're, they've not been very good offensively under Chris Ash. You know he's now in his third year, and I think maybe Oregon State was just a better offensive team than Rutgers, even though Oregon State's pretty bad and overall. I'd agree with that. You know they had some players back there that running back, and you know busted off those two big runs. Yep. You know has yep. has speed to hang with anyone. Um, yep. I think they got a couple players that Rutgers at this point is just lacking, and so you know that add it all together and it was like holy crap you know i guess Rutgers finally got on the board after what was it it was like 11 quarters yeah like 10 or 11 quarters <laughs> without yeah. getting on the board against ohio state they finally yeah. got on the board but but it yeah. still didn't really look much different than the last couple of years so yeah. 
Yeah, 56 to nothing, uh, 58 to nothing. Rutgers uh, ekes out a field goal in this one to uh, avoid a three straight year shutout against the Buckeyes. Uh, but your boy, Nick Bosa, five tackles in the game, led the Buckeyes defensively. All five were solo, including three for loss and a sack. And. Your man Jordan Fuller uh, tied a bevy of other Buckeyes with three tackles in the game. Two of them were solo, and he had a pass breakup. Um, And Tough Borland, three tackles in the game as well. Um, So, yeah, you know, having those guys back, Jordan Fuller uh, getting Tough Borland a little more time in the game there to get acclimated to the field, the speed, all of that kind of stuff, certainly a very, very good thing. Um, Chase Young, two tackles in the game, Chris. Only two, but he made them both count for sacks uh, as well as having a pass breakup. However, gets ejected there uh, in like what the late third quarter, early fourth quarter uh, Mm -hmm. for coming out onto the field and celebrating uh, after Sean Wade got an interception, first interception of uh, Sean Wade's Buckeye career. And he, he gets ejected there in the second half. Now, because this wasn't like a, a personal foul targeting penalty, and we were all trying to figure this out when it happened, and, and I, I had other stuff going on. I apologize. I have you know other things to tend to uh, than looking up Ohio State football stats all the time, believe it or not. But I am not sure, even at this point, and hopefully you can help me out with this, as to whether or not Chase Young is going to be suspended for the first half of this week's upcoming game against TCU. No, he's available. So it was just okay. for this one game. But yeah, so he had it was two penalties was why I got ejected. He had the taunting where yeah, right. he, he did the it was actually he, he had the hat trick. It was a sack, force fumble, fumble recovery, and then he got up and spiked the ball. And they ruled it on the field that he was down, just a sack. But the the replay showed that the ball was out before he hit the ground. So I mean that was an amazing plan. <laughs> like, man, you talk yeah. about I mean I, I've heard the nickname for him, the Predator, and I guess he almost kind of looks like it with the, the dreadlocks. <laughs> he does. You know? He's got the big, long dreadlocks, yeah. And he, and he plays like the Predator, too. <laughs> He's like, the, the comparison <laughs> doesn't stop at the hair. But, right. But man, I mean, he just ate his lunch, and you know, you always got to love the hat trick. But, uh, but yeah, so he gets up. He's excited. He spikes the ball. He's excited for his buddy, Sean Wade, and jumps on the field. Um, you know, Sean O, they asked him about that. I think in the, this morning in the, the press conference, um, I just watched it today. I think it was from this morning. Um, but he, you know, he said basically, uh, you know, he wants his players to play with passion. He wants his players to be excited. And he's, he's like, he just needs to dial it back just a tiny touch. He's like, I don't want to, I don't want him to play without passion. And I want him to get fired to not be fired up, but you know, you do have to harness it just, just a little. We could just harness it just a little. So, you know, yeah, it make well, a difference I mean, against Rutgers. Um, if he's getting, if he's spiking the ball and, you know, after sacks versus TCU, um, it's not going to be cute anymore, you know. Well, let's hope that he can uh, dial it back uh, come this uh, weekend against the 14th ranked at TCU or uh, 15th ranked or 14th, 14th or 15th. Uh, I think they are actually, let's see here. Uh, God, why, why do I not know this? Yeah. Uh, what the fuck did they move up to? Why the fuck am I fucking blanking on this shit? I don't know. I don't know why you're yeah. blanking on it. Why yeah, are well, I'll figure it? it out in a second. Anyways. Uh, yeah, <laughs> hopefully he can, uh, dial it back, uh, come this weekend against TCU. Cause they got a big one, but before we, uh, you know, jump into a TCU preview, um, what did you think, uh, about the offensive effort? What, 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 I, I mean, what, why am I even asking you this? Of course you thought the offensive effort was stellar. Johnny <laughs> Dixon said that catching passes from Dwayne Haskins is like mama's home cooking right in your lap. And I mean to tell you, dude, Dwayne Haskins, some of these throws he was making on Saturday, I'm like, where is he going? Like, you know, Johnny Dixon had a step or two and he just 
boom, put it right on the money where he knew that only Johnny Dixon or Paris Campbell or, uh, you know, KJ Hill, Ben Victor, Austin Mack, all those guys. He is putting the ball in a spot where he is so confident that only this guy can catch it. Haskins, 20 of 23, 233 yards. Four touchdowns, no interceptions, and we'll get to his backup, Tate Martell, in a second. <laughs> but what is the discernible difference, Chris? And I think everybody out there in Buckeye Nation obviously knows what the discernible difference is. But I was in a discussion with my dad just last night, and he was like, hey, you know, JT Barrett, this guy is going to go down as one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time in Ohio State history. And for good reason, he should. But I said to him, I was like, Dad, though, can't you just tell there is a difference between the two when it comes to throwing the football? And he said, absolutely. And I'm sure you, as well as everybody else out there, it, it, the difference just seems to be astronomical. When Dwayne Haskins steps back to throw the football, don't you just feel a whole lot more confident than when JT was throwing it? Well, you know, it's not just that he's completing this amazing percentage of balls. It's the way he's completing them. I mean, they're like all, for lack of a better word, like perfect throws. They're all like hitting the guy in stride. You know, it's one thing yes. to complete it and you and you have to you have to wait up for the ball or uh, make a diving catch or all. This. It's like no, it's like right where they you know the guys are getting open. Don't get me wrong, the guys the wide receivers are getting open. This is inferior competition, but he's hitting them in stride. It's not like like with JT, guys would come open and he'd hit them. But they'd have to like sit there and wait for the ball, and then they wouldn't get much after that because it'd allow the defense to catch up, or you know that sort of thing. So it's it's not just the stats; it's the way they look when they're completing. I mean, he's he's throwing to guys like before they're open, right? Exactly. Throwing, he's like anticipating. Okay, they're going to complete the button hook at this point. You you don't wait till they've completed it. You wait till they're like moving into that so that the ball arrives right when they're completing it, and. It's a huge difference, and frankly, without you know, at the risk of derailing the show, it kind of pisses me off that he didn't play last year because it ruined Ohio State's chances at a potential national title. Because you really think so? So let's you really let's, let's believe this, that. Well, I mean, let's put it this way: Ohio State had um, there was people who a lot of people who thought they should have been the playoffs. Now, if you remember, JT Barrett. Was losing versus Michigan. Dwayne Haskins comes in and is unstoppable, leads him down the field on like five consecutive drives to score to, to win the game. Next week, Bar Barrett plays injured, looks awful, and Ohio State squeaks by Wisconsin. Well, if, if, if Haskins was playing, you got to believe it wouldn't have been in squeaking by them. Like, I think they would have beat them soundly. And that would have been enough to put them in because they were like, there were so many people who thought they should have been in anyway, even with just squeaking by Wisconsin. So I think that would have been enough that they'd have been in the playoffs. Then that, that would have put them in as the fourth seed. I think they matched up really well with Clemson, just like Alabama matched up really well with Clemson. They had similar strengths, like the strengths of Ohio State matched up with the weaknesses of Clemson. And I think they would have easily gotten, like, Clemson, I thought was the weak link. So that they would have got by week one. And then it was just a question, could they get by Georgia? And with Barrett at the helm, I don't, I don't think they could have. But if Haskins is back there, um, I take my chances. I mean, that's a, at a minimum, that's a coin flip. If not, you know, maybe I, I would argue that Ohio State has the more talented roster than, than Georgia. And the recruiting rankings, if they mean anything, would say that you know, Ohio State had the more talented roster. So they would have more talent probably a better coach. I think that's historically, you know what I mean? They got better talent, better coach have like a, a guy who might go number one over in the, in the draft this spring. If he keeps up this, if he keeps looking like this all season long, I mean, you can forget about him playing, being a starter for more than one year. And it's like, damn it. Did, did we, did we just miss uh, at some point? I'm going to go through like <laughs> how many national titles we could have won since urban Meyer has been here. And but I don't want to derail the show because I, I, I feel like we could have had a lot more than one. But I'm, I'm going to stop it right there. But but yeah, so I'm, I'm a little I'm a little salty when I look back at how 2017 ended, knowing what we know now. And and you know we got glimpses of it last year. It's not like, you know, Haskins wasn't ready last year and he needed a full spring to. to it's like no, he looked like the better QB last year, and freaking Urban still played. You know he's loyal to the the senior. Well, my one uh, 
contrarian point to that would be the fact that after Iowa, I mean, they didn't lose a game. You know, they didn't. And I understand, though, that they were losing to Michigan when Dwayne came in late in the third quarter to take over for an injured JT and essentially kind of quasi led the team back. But don't forget that in that Michigan game, when they were down 14 nothing, JT was the guy who did bring them back and scored two straight touchdowns to make it a 14-14 ball game. And then Michigan came out and scored there in the third quarter. And so... You know, was there anything extra that Dwayne could have given Ohio State after the Iowa game that JT didn't give them? Because they won the rest of their games. So I see what you're saying. You know, they could have maybe have won more, maybe have piled it on more. But as far as I'm concerned, I mean, hey, a win is a win. And, you know, JT was in those games and they definitely won. Now, the Wisconsin game, you know, you look at it, JT had a great first half. Second half, not so much. But this was also against a fourth-ranked undefeated Wisconsin team that had a pretty damn good defense. So would Dwayne have been able to, to do any better in that Big Ten championship game? I don't know. But all I got to say is, is that they won uh, essentially you know, with JT after his <laughs> performance in the Iowa game that led to a 31-point loss in his four interceptions. Um but at that point, you know, he is a fifth-year senior. He is a three-time captain. You know, he is a virtually a four-year starter. And it is tough to go away from somebody like that um, unless you're Nick Saban and you put in a true freshman over your sophomore in the national championship game for the second half who, who helps you beat that Georgia team to win a national championship. But I, I, I get what you're saying, and that's why I ask, you know, uh, your opinion of – what you think Dwayne Haskins looks like right now, because I mean, he's just, he does, he just, he looks head and shoulders so far above uh, JT Barrett in being a true stand in the pocket, uh, you know, quarterback and throwing the football. Uh, it's amazing to see the difference. So I will limit myself to responding to just one comment you made. And you said, <laughs> okay, J J they didn't lose a game after, after Iowa, a win is a win. When it comes to the playoffs, yeah. a win is a win is not a win. So if they just well. squeak by Wisconsin in 2014, they don't leap two teams and they don't win the national title. If they a, lo a loss is not a loss either. If they lose by three points to Iowa instead of getting their asses handed to them, they're in the playoffs last year. Is because they make no mistake about it. If they only that was the reason that kept them out. Everybody said, you know what, Ohio State's resume is way better than Alabama's. They've beat way better teams. Alabama's beat no one, and Ohio State's beat you know X, Y, and Z. But they lost to Iowa by like a bajillion points. You know, it was like that was the the the, the eyesore. If they lose to Iowa by three points, they're in. So uh, uh, you know, this is partially a, a beauty pageant. You know, and, and the, when you're you've got a committee selecting four teams, you know, based on whoever they feel like should be in there, not based on who won their conference or it's whatever they feel like. So at any rate, um, you know, like I said, we there's only so much time of the day and we're going to do a show. So you also mentioned a one Mr. Big Ten freshman of the week, Tate Martell, who only, yeah, boy. O only went 10 for 10 passing. You know, is that it? That's, he that's complete every single with, pass. 10 for 10 with the, with the TD. And then he also led the team in rushing with like a spectacular, you know, I, Whew. I, he, I tell you what, he's the best rushing quarterback we've had since Braxton. And, um, oh yeah. He, I mean, he doesn't look like Braxton the way he runs, but he is electric. Uh, and so he's going to be fun to watch, you know, probably as early as next year, unfortunately, because I don't, at this rate, Dwayne Haskins, I'm, I'm giving up hope that he's going to start for two years for us. Ooh, but, well, let um, me tell you what, if, if, if Dwayne Haskins keeps playing the way he's playing, like you just alluded towards a few minutes ago, um, and, Let's not even say that they win the national championship year, but they get into the college football playoff. And let's say they even get to the national championship game and it's a nice competitive game uh, and Ohio State gets beat. Hell, he may still leave. I mean, that's how good he looks right now. But let's not get too ahead of ourselves, Chris. Oh, it's only two uh, games and it's versus two of the worst FBS right. teams 
out there. No, I'm sorry. Two of the worst Power Five FBS teams out right. there. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're right. You're right. I mean, the wide receivers were wide open. Um, he was under very little pressure, although he was sacked twice versus Rutgers. So there's this is true. There's room for improvement there. But I mean, in general. The offensive line was dominating. They were, they were running the ball, which, of course, makes it easier on the passing game. They were playing him kind of interestingly, um, you know, with the, with the safeties. They were playing like press – or the, the cornerbacks were playing press coverage. That's just what Rutgers does. It doesn't matter who you are. And they didn't really have the athletes to do that versus an Ohio State. It works for them versus most teams. But versus Ohio State, they just – they were blown right by them. It's, they really would have been better off – adopting a different scheme for Ohio state and maybe playing eight, 10 yards off the guys and, you know, forcing them to dink and dunk their way down the field rather than giving up the home runs. But, um, but yeah, I mean the, the QBs combined went 30 for 33, 30 yep. for 33. So that's a nine Oh nine pe- completion percentage, which ties for second best in the program's history wow. where they, the only time they did better than that Let's see. They they had uh, eight passes that where they completed all of them versus Iowa in 1975, and it's like okay, eight passes, eleven passes. I, that's basically that this, the sample size is so small. Where this was 33 passes, I basically say this is the closest game Ohio State's ever had to a per- perfect passing day. So does it give you any um, confidence in Tate? For the future, considering he might be the starter next year, depending on how things shake out for the rest of this season, that he went 10 of 10 for 121 yards, one touchdown pass, which just happened to be a 51-yarder to Terry McLaurin, which, quite honestly, was a little underthrown. McLaurin had to (laughs) wait for a second. He had to turn around and wait for it, but he was able to make the catch, backpedal into the end zone. Otherwise, I mean, Tate Martell still 9 and 9 for 70 yards, okay? Uh, But Tate led the Buckeyes on the ground, 95 yards, eight carries, one of them being a 47-yard scamper, which was actually a design pass play that Tate Martell, a la Braxton Miller, a la Terrell Pryor, a la JT Barrett, turned into a run, and he was just fast enough to beat the defense and turn it into a 47-yard scamper. But seeing those kinds of stats, granted, yeah, it's against Rutgers, but does a game like this at least maybe give you a little more confidence in Tate that he might be able to, you know, be effective enough to get the job done? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I definitely think there's a big drop off in the juggernaut that Ohio State's offense is this year with Haskins at the helm when you go to Martell. But he's competent and the, it looks like all the pieces are there on that offense. I don't really see a weak spot on that offense. They've got good players and depth all across the board. So if he could just come in and be competent, they're going to be pretty good versus, you know, all the teams on their schedule as of now. I mean, maybe, maybe they don't win a national title with Martell in there where, you know, they've got a shot to do that with Haskins, but, but they can, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm having confidence seeing what he did that, you know, it's not going to be disastrous if Haskins goes down, God forbid. Yeah, God forbid. As I knock furiously on wood over here. Well, let me tell you what. After this year, let's just say Haskins leaves. Mike Weber's more than likely gone, right? Paris Campbell's gone. Uh, I'm going to Terry McLaurin, mm, Johnny KJ, Dixon. Aren't they both seniors? Campbell, Campbell, Dixon, McLaurin, all fifth year seniors, all gone. KJ Hill, fourth year junior. Not sure he's NFL material, quite frankly. Um, Maybe after next year, but hey, he's a fourth year junior. He could leave too. Hell, Benjamin Victor, uh, Austin Mack, they're both juniors this year. Who knows? They could leave too. I highly doubt that's the case, at least with Austin Mack. Uh, but, you know, Ben Victor, 
both Victor and Mac I see as being NFL caliber players. KJ Hill might try and take a stab at it too, especially depending on how they do this year. Uh, because next year, if Haskins leaves, let me tell you what, I think there's not only going to be, there's obviously going to be an exodus with Campbell and, and, and Dixon and McLaurin, but there might be a couple other guys leave too. So this year could be the year uh, if they're going to prove something offensively. Because next year, if it's Tate Martell running the helm, I'll be honest with you, dude. I'm not totally sold right now on Tate Martell. Not 100%. I get it. No, right. 10 yeah, for 10, oh, I, I 120 yards, a touchdown, eight carries, 95 yards. But just something there. He's just, uh, he just, he reminds me of JT Barrett, honestly. Right. Not as strong yeah. of an arm, great runner, uh, better than JT in that, in that sense, as far as I'm concerned. Faster, uh, shiftier. But uh, when it comes to, you know, throwing the football, not really sold on Tate Martell yet. Not sure if he'll ever get there. Oh, and here's the thing. I, I know JT had some injuries, but JT like took a pounding. JT was a pretty tough guy. No debating that. Uh, no debating. I, I mean, Tate Martell is 5'10", and you saw like he got his bell rung. You know, versus Rutgers. I'm like, dude, get out of bounds. <laughs> you know? Wallop, wallop on the sideline. <laughs> you know, I'm like, you need to learn to slide or something. Jesus. But the, the um, I mean, I guess in his defense, the guy did get called for a late hit. He was trying to get out of bounds and, and the guy got called. Which for... I thought was a com- complete bull crap call. I'm sorry. That was a bull crap call. It seemed like crap. the contact was initiated while he was still in bounds. So he was in midair. He had, yeah, I mean, yeah, he was going out of bounds, but foot ball until they rewrite the rule that says if a player is clearly going out of bounds you can't hit him yet if he's still in bounds he is fully legal for contact until they change that rule i'm sorry tate martell yes he was going out of bounds and he was in midair as he was kind of crossing over the plane of 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 the sideline there but he was still in he had yet to physically touch out of bounds and the guy got called for uh, a late hit i'm like late hit the guy he, tate martell hadn't even stepped out of bounds yet bull crap call i'm sorry bull crap yeah i i'm not gonna argue with you on it and you know we're not we haven't even mentioned so far the the new rule about fair catching on kick returns i mean uh yeah that's that's so stupid but uh, at any rate, well, the Buckeyes, though, pile it on. The Rutgers Scarlet Knights get win number two of the season, 52-3. to three. Uh, Now, though, Chris, um, they are going to be taking on the Texas Christian University Horn Frogs in Arlington, Jerry World, AT&T Stadium, this coming Saturday, 8 o'clock p.m., live primetime game on ABC. Chris, this one is going to be a knee knocker. What do you think? (laughs) Is TCU ready to face Ohio State? And subversely, is Ohio State ready to face TCU? Well, you know, neither team has really played a good opponent yet. I mean... I guess you could argue that Ohio State's two power five opponents would be like marginally better than TCU's FCS opponent and American Athletic Conference opponent. You know, they at least were playing power five teams. Um, and, And TCU hasn't necessarily shown itself to be a juggernaut through the first two weeks. You know, I mean, they were when they were playing, um, oh geez, who was it, um, this week? They, you know, they were, it was pretty close for the first half where like Ohio state's just crushed people right out of the gate, you know, first five drives, five touchdowns kind of thing. Uh, Talking about who TCU played this weekend, this past weekend. Yeah. SMU. Yeah. SMU. I mean, they, SMU was in that game for a little while, you know, and they, TCU kind of poured it on the second half, but, but, you know, we are talking about a team that's averaged 10 wins per season over the last 10 years. Um, I mean, Gary Patterson's teams, they're always competitive they have nine, nine, count them nine wins over national top 15 teams in the last five wow. years alone. That's pretty good. Yeah. That's pretty good. Now, um, you know, they're, they're playing a top five team now, not just a top 15. But, um, you know, I mean, they're not going to back down. They're not going to be scared. And they're going to believe that they can win this game. And, and I, I think that, well, I mean, we'll see, I mean, maybe, maybe Ohio state's just that much better, but I think they have a shot at winning the game. If Ohio state plays poorly or, you know, they get out coached or what, you know, any number of things, they just come in and want it more than Ohio state. Um, this is a team that, you know, Ohio state's going to have to play a good game to win. I, I think. 
I mean, they are 12 and a half point favorites, but um, it's it's a winnable game for TCU. Now, maybe we'll get we'll, they'll come out there and it'll like we'll look like they're in a whole different class, and we'll be like, yeah, okay, maybe this wasn't a winnable game for TCU. Ohio State's just a, a monster this year. We'll see. That, I would love to to see that, but I mean, going into it, I'm thinking like you know, they Ohio State could lose this. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, my guess is that it's probably going to be a hard game and that, you know, this is a game TCU can win if if they come out and want it more than Ohio State. And Ohio State makes mistakes and they take advantage of them and that sort of thing. So and it's it's not in the friendly confines of Ohio Stadium, you know, I mean. Uh, yeah, it, but you know what? It's in the friendly confines of AT&T Stadium <laughs> where Ohio State does have some experience playing, including this past uh, winter in the Cotton Bowl against USC right. and some game where they beat Oregon for the national championship. This is true. I, I mean, it is only 18 miles from TCU's campus. But, yes. But I think, I mean, it's not like, you know, if, if we were actually playing against TCU, they would have control of the tickets and they'd only have to release like a couple thousand to Ohio State, right? Where because it's at a you know quote unquote neutral site, I think it's pretty much fifty fifty. So I kind of expect to see half the stadium Buckeye fans. You know, I think you know Ohio State traditionally travels really well, and the alumni base is huge and national, and there's tons of Buckeyes in the Texas area because you know there's so many good jobs out there. So you know, I think there's you know it's not going to be like a home game per se for TCU, but I think it's going to be like a neutral site game. I don't think it's going to be or a clear home field advantage for either team. See, I'm with you on that one, and I've gotten into uh, some debates with people at work about this game, and, and a couple of guys are like, ah, oh, yeah, this this ain't no home game for TCU. It's not their locker room. It's not their stadium. And I get that. I can see that. Okay, yeah, you're right. You know, it's not the same setup that they're used to walking into for a traditional home game in Amon, you know, G. Carter Stadium. Um, However, yeah, come on, man. Like you said, they're less than 20 miles away from their own stadium. So don't sit here and tell me that this isn't more of a home game for TCU than it is for Ohio State. But – on the flip side, to your point, Ohio State fans traditionally do travel well, and they have a much larger uh, alumni and fan base than TCU. So I think Ohio State's going to travel well, um, and I think that the TCU fans are going to be out. I think it could be 50-50, but quite frankly, Chris, yeah, I'm not expecting this game to be a blowout for Ohio State. Now, if they come out and win, you know, 45 to, you know, 21, something like what they did when they went down um, to, to Norman and beat Oklahoma on their field back in 2016 by, you know, 24 points. If they do that to TCU, now I'm really prepared to say Ohio State is for real. But it, there's just something in my brain that's telling me that – there's going to be a lot of offense put up in this game. And I'm not taking anything away from Ohio State's defense, but just something tells me that TCU is going to come out fired up and they're going to score some points. I don't know if they'll necessarily score 31, but I don't think Ohio State is necessarily going to score even 52. Granted, Big 12, we know, doesn't like to play any defense. So who knows? Maybe Ohio State is going to come out and put up some points um, on the Horned Frogs. But I think this is going to be a heck of a football game because this is an early season test for both teams. Like you said, both teams really haven't played anybody. Granted, Ohio State has played two FBS teams where TCU uh, has played one, and it was SMU who's in whatever the hell league they're in, the American Athletic <laughs> Conference or the WAC or the MAC or the you know the swack or the meack or i it, it, it's gotten to the point now where I, I i don't even keep up with who's in what conference anymore unless it's a power five that's sad to say um but granted smu is not a power five school i know that for a fact right. um but i still think that tcu is going to come out fired up and be looking to play some football yeah i think you're right i think that um you know this this could be a shootout you know they don't play a good defense in the in the Big Twelve traditionally, 
Um, I think TCU's got a decent defense, though. I think they're they're definitely a step up in defense versus what Ohio State's had the first two weeks. You know, they're not agreed. Up, they're not going to put up ten offensive touchdowns on TCU. It's just not going to no. happen. No. But at the same time, I th- I think they're going to put up points on them, and I think they're they're going to have to, and they they might they're going to quickly realize that they're going to have to, and they keep the pedal to the floor because I think TCU is going to have some ability to move the ball on this team. They've got a, a, an athletic quarterback. He's got some ability to throw. Um, not a great passer, you know, but he, but he's, he, you, you can't just like discount his passing, but he is a pretty good runner though, you know, and that's going to open things up. I'm sure they're going to do things to take advantage of that. And Ohio state does this thing where on obvious passing downs, they'll have the linebackers crowd the line of scrimmage. And then, so you don't know who's coming, right? Because there's defensive linemen up there. There's line. They're all. They're, they're showing like full house blitz. And then when the ball is snapped, like half the linebackers, the linebackers will turn turn their back on the ball and sprint to a spot behind them and then turn around. Well, meanwhile, when they turn around, they're like, "Where the fuck's the ball? What the hell is the play?" And you're really susceptible to stuff like quick slants, screens to running backs, uh, a running a quarterback just taking off and running. You know, so if he sees them up there like that, he might just say, screw it, I'm taking off. Or, you know, th- th- I, I think you're going to see that because Ohio State's so susceptible to that anyway with pretty poor linebacker play and safety play. They could be vulnerable to that. So I, I think I'm, I'm going to say Ohio State doesn't get the 51 points they got against Rutgers. They don't get the 77 they got against Oregon State. But they're pretty close because they also, against those teams, they pulled the starters. And I don't think they're going to pull the starters. So they're going to have like that full juggernaut Ohio State offense out there for you know, three, four full quarters. So I'm going to say Ohio state 45, which is a lot more points than what TCU has given up to this point. But again, you know, they've been playing the little sisters of the poor. Um, but at the same time, they're going to give up some points. I think TCU has a better offense than Oregon state. You know, Oregon state got 31. <sighs> uh, man, I've, I, I almost feel like saying like 38, um, but I feel like maybe that's cutting it a little too. I'm going to say, I guess I'll say 35. They outscore Oregon State. So Ohio State wins 45 to 35. Well, this is a TCU team, Chris, uh, featuring a true sophomore quarterback, Sean Robinson, um, who was the Gatorade Texas Player of the Year as a high school senior in 2016. Uh, He was a U.S. Army All-American, and he did choose to go play for TCU over teams such as LSU, such as Texas, uh, such as Baylor, Michigan, Texas A&M, UCLA, and Ohio State and Alabama. So supposedly, you know, this kid had offers to go play all over the place, chose to stay somewhat close to home. Of course, the other Texas schools there would have been close to home as well. Um, but a guy that is extremely athletic and right now leads TCU – Obviously, in passing and rushing, 10 carries, 112 yards for the sophomore, three touchdowns, which accounts for their total five rushing TDs uh, on the season. Uh, Through the air, he is 33 of 53, which is a little better than 62%. He has thrown four touchdown passes, uh, one interception, and a total of 336 yards. Now remember, they have played one FBS team. The other team was Southern. Um, in comparison, <laughs> Dwayne Haskins has at least played two FBS teams, uh, power five FBS teams, including, uh, in, uh, a divisional conference opponent. And right now Haskins is 42 of 53 through the air for almost 80% of his passes complete 546 yards, nine touchdowns, one interception uh his rushing stats not nearly as gaudy because uh well quite frankly uh he's (laughs) only run the ball about what four times technically he had two runs this past weekend against Rutgers and they were both the sacks that he took so um uh man I'd like to you know what looking at this sitting here thinking about it 
you know what? I as you were going over your your synopsis, and you said what forty five to thirty five. That's right. Okay. So I have them not beating the spread. The spread's twelve and a half. At least last I checked. Yes, I, that's what I saw as well. You know what? I think Ohio State goes down there, and I don't. You know what? I'm gonna go. I am completely now, Chris. I am doing a 180 mid show, <laughs> mid sentence, right. practically. I am changing my whole rhetoric. Something has just blown up in my brain. Has just popped. Maybe I've had an aneurysm or a stroke. You may need to call 911 <laughs> here. At any minute, I am going to completely flip the script, dude. I am going to sit here and say that Ohio State goes down and beats TCU by 17 points, 38-21. Ooh, low scoring. Buckeyes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because I do think at least TCU is going to be the best defense that Ohio State has seen so far. Um, But Mm. I think, obviously, TC or Ohio State, is going to be the best defense that TCU has seen by far. Uh, the Hell, the fact that I think I've even given TCU 21 points right now may be a little generous, but just because of the fact that they're ranked, it's kind of close to home for them. Um, I'm going to give them a little bit of the benefit of the doubt, but I'm going to say right now, in fact, the previous two games, Chris, I have said Ohio State wouldn't cover the spread. Now I'm going to go the opposite way and say against a ranked team on the road, first road game of the season without their head coach. That's right, because this is the last game that Ohio State is playing without their fearless leader, Urban Meyer. I still say they go down there to Arlington, AT&T Stadium, within 20 miles of the TCU campus, and they beat the Horned Frogs and cover the spread 38-21, mark it down. All right, marking that down. Thirty-eight twenty-one for Andy. Now I and will I say got this: forty-five thirty-five. Right. I will say this: if Ohio State blows the doors off of TCU, I will not be surprised. And here's the the reason why: their offense, if it gets rolling, they. I mean, you might not be able to stop them. I mean, remember, like the the offense that they had in two thousand fourteen. I mean, this offense looks better than that one that they had during those last three games that was just rolling mm. people just became and, a and that's, unstoppable. Um, it's and then, pretty heavy to say with guys like Zeke Elliott and Michael Thomas, and Evan Spencer, Devin Smith. Well, I'll tell you what, <laughs> I'll tell you what, but I, I almost agree with you. I almost agree with you. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't, and when you, when you put it like that, it makes it me sound like a freaking idiot, but I, I feel like they have more depth at wide receiver. And I feel like Agreed. Haskins is clearly a better quarterback than 12 gauge. I mean, I love Cardell Jones. We'll always love that man, but I I feel like Haskins is better. Um, so I mean, the other thing too, is once you start getting behind, if you go into just full passing mode and Ohio state, just, you know, they're out there with a rushman package and they're just pinning their ears back and coming. I mean, they've in two games, they've injured two starting quarterbacks. I, you know, I, 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 that guy could be fearing for his life. You know, because they've got some players that are unblockable. Nick Bosa's um, Nick Bosa was going against, by all accounts, an NFL offensive tackle, that guy that he was playing opposite, you know, in Rutgers, and was just, you know, ate his lunch. He just that guy couldn't block him. Chase Young, two sacks. Chase Young look has, has looked pretty unblockable this year. BB Landers has looked unblockable. Um, I mean, Draymond Jones is probably going to be a first round draft fix. Worst case scenario, second round draft pick. He's got a few sacks yeah. this year. Oh, yeah. I think. I think if you put this this team, if you're in a, if you get behind and you feel like you need to pass, you're it's over. I mean, the, the, then like I mean, it, it, the game could just get out of hand real quick. You know, you start then you start getting sacked, you start getting fumbles, interceptions. So I could see this game getting out of hand. I mean, I'm, I'm not calling that, but I, I certainly won't be surprised. Um, can. Ohio State's defense come to play because, yeah, we saw them give up 31 points to Oregon State at home. And TCU's probably got just about as good of offensive weapons as Oregon State, if not a lot better. Um, So, yeah, they cannot let TCU come out and punch them in the mouth right away because if TCU does, if TCU takes a lead early, I think that's going to be their saving grace in not getting beat as bad or possibly even winning the football game 
But if Ohio State gets up on TCU early, I don't think there's any chance that TCU can come back and make a game of it. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. But you know what I wasn't looking forward to? What? A certain streak ended on Saturday. Do you know who? what four-game losing streak ended last Saturday? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, would it be the smelly rodents from that state up north? Yeah, they uh, they beat up on, you know, directional state or, U. Uh, oh, it, it took Western Michigan for them to finally get a win. They were, they were on a four-game losing streak. Wisconsin yeah. last season, Ohio State, South Carolina in the bowl, and Notre Dame. And, then, so, and you know what other streak they yeah. had? They had gone 364 days without a wide receiver touchdown. Can you? I know. I 364 saw that. days. So I'm like, wow. I could. I mean, I was like, no, 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 no. This is <laughs> this is a misprint. <laughs> there is no way that is possible. I mean, they they what? So that means they basically had a wide receiver score a touchdown like what their first or second game of last season. And then never scored another one since. Yeah, that that offense is in the friggin' Stone Ages. And, uh, yeah, so much Ooh. for uh, the quarterback whisperer, old, uh, you know, Tom- old Jimmy Cax. Yeah, Jimmy Cax. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Caggies. He likes to wear his Caggies. Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh goodness well, all right my man hey i tell you what uh let's go ahead let's shut it off it's getting late it's almost past my bedtime i don't know about you but uh i hear uh i hear the pillows calling my name but before we hit the hay anything you want to tell the listeners out there maybe we didn't cover uh last uh, hour oh just that uh you know i do have another podcast it's a personal development podcast. It's called Choice Conversations. You can find me anywhere where you would find podcasts, you know, iTunes, Stitchers, et cetera, or at choiceconversations.com. So if you would like to improve your life in all areas, come check it out, Choice Conversations. Hit you, it, it, check you out on Stitcher, iTunes, hit you up on Twitter, Facebook, all that good stuff. You got it. Yeah, just do if, yeah, you, you, I'm not hard to find. If you do a search for Choice Conversations, I'm there. If they do a search for Chris Stefanik, the intergalactic Buckeye fan himself, will that come up on Google? Well, if they do Chris Stefanik, intergalactic Buckeye fan, I will come up. If they do Chris Stefanik, I actually will not come up because there is another Chris Stefanik who is more famous than I am. And he will he dominates page one of Google if you just search for Chris Stefanik. No, I don't I don't believe that for a freaking <laughs> second. Seriously, <laughs> that's got to be a fallacy, an absolute fallacy. I will tell you this. I just Googled Christophonic intergalactic Buckeye fan, and guess what? Buckeye Leaf cast came up. Yep. Yeah, you have to add the intergalactic Buckeye fan if you want to Google Christophonic. So you Chris have Stefanik. to add the intergalactic Buckeye fan. But or Choice Conversations. Yeah, or just Choice Conversations. Or go 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 check them out. Uh, go check you out on, on Stitcher. Go check you out on iTunes. Go you, you hit you up on Facebook, uh, uh, Twitter, all that good stuff. So there you have it. This episode of the Buckeye Leafcast also brought to you by Christie's Cleaning Services, LLC. It ain't clean until it's Christy clean. Be sure to visit her Facebook page at Christy's Cleaning Services, LLC. Also brought to you by Columbus Wired for your premier source for sports in and around the Central Ohio area. Be sure to check out the folks over there at ColumbusWired.net. So, Chris, you say 45-35 Buckeyes. I got 38-21 only time's going to tell. We only got a few days left until kickoff here at AT&T Stadium. Good old Jerry World, Saturday night, 8 o'clock p.m., live and in color on ABC for the fourth-ranked <laughs> Ohio State Buckeyes and the 15th-ranked or 14th-ranked, depending on what poll you go by, uh, TCU Horn Frogs. Should be a good one, brother. I agree. I'm looking forward to it. Let's leave them like we always do, sir. Go H. Go Bucks. I want to go back to Ohio State, to old Columbus town. To the same to hear the band, by far the finest in the land. I want to go back to Ohio State, to old Columbus town.